interesting, that's actually a small system. So we'll just make sure we can have this. Great start, small, it's actually not much bigger. Still a good way to go. So if anybody can't hear me, just let me know. Oh, sorry. So is the system inside the building? Uh, it's actually on the side of the small green. Sorry. Oh, on the side of the small green. So who are we? Well, Rainwater Services, that's the boss right there. <laughs> this is where it says um. Oh. Oh. Oh, We're um, <clears throat> licensed irrigation contracting firm. Started a few years ago here in Dallas County. Um, but as opposed to most irrigation companies, we really only focus on water conserving irrigation. And, and, and in particular, rainwater harvesting, we started with, obviously I started the company, so I started with it. Um, folks on drip, micro, landscape drainage. Of course, we will do traditional irrigation. It's an irrigation firm, but in all cases, we focus on conserving water, and not you know, water in the dry the street, the curb, or something like that. First, I was the first ARSA accredited professional in the state of Florida. Now, I think there are, I don't even know how many, so it's great to know in just a few years how fast the community is growing, the industry is growing. First, permitted rainwater harvesting system in St. Pete. I say permitted. First potable rainwater harvesting system would be the same as well, the same in Tampa. And to my knowledge, we were instrumental in part of the first permitted rainwater system in Tampa. Uh, and I put question marks there because I'm not really sure if that's true or not, but all the inspectors who checked out the system were completely that for life, so they seem to imply that it was the first one we see. <coughs> so why do we want to harvest rainwater? I think everybody knows. Um, really to offset potable use. You know, Tampa Bay Water, Swift Run, all the players, all the governments, everybody. There's a lot of money and, and time and effort invested in, in taking water and potable infrastructure, domestic water infrastructure. Um, so we want to make that infrastructure last as long as possible. Of course, for the population, you know, we're not losing population in Dallas County, in the national sample area, um, so it's very important to look to ways to conserve the resources that will last as long as possible. So, um, obviously, the strategy is conserving rainwater, um, uh, conserving water in general, but also thinking of rainwater and other alternative water sources that are relatively inexpensive, certainly for non potable applications, irrigation, and total budget, things like that. Um, rainwater harvesting is also important, can, can be used as an important part of stormwater management. Um, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Basically, um, reduce pollution runoff and reduce demand on the stormwater infrastructure as well. So I think it's all there's no impact of all and things like that. Um, and in that regard, all this contributes to responsible growth. Um, we're we're going to continue developing and growing as a community, as a region, so we want to do that responsibly and ensure they're adequate resources for everyone. Um, and uh, by the larger volume of those pure cost savings, uh, economies of scale, really, uh, 
hundred gallon rainwater system versus a ten thousand gallon rainwater system, the cost per gallon is substantially reduced the large you get. So a really large scale everybody in Wilmington becomes relatively relatively expensive. <coughs> well let's we can talk about cost more than which we'll be about that. Hey Brian. Yeah. For those of us in the back, I'm there's sorry. like um, an ice machine or something in the kitchen that's kind of making a humming noise. Okay. And part of it is I'm kind of plugged up trying to get over a cold. But if you could speak to the yeah. yeah. Thanks. I feel like the 80s hairband rocker. How do I do that? It's way too close. Okay, so the problem it's simple supply and demand. Um, we have, like I said, a continuously growing region with a lot of demands on our resources. Um, and so that leads to increased demand on what I call traditional water sources. Um, Tampa Bay Water actually provided me with a slide those days, uh, the information here. So traditional water, you think of as groundwater, surface water, and that's predominantly what supplies our drinking water sources. Uh, but as the resources as the resources come into more demand and more people demand those demand, demand more demand is placed on those resources, we have to start looking towards more called innovative or more non-traditional resources, um, such as the desal plant, um, which dollar per dollar, dollar per dollar, the cost to deliver desal water and innovative water, as opposed to more traditional water, is substantially higher. Uh, and so, as the population continues to grow, and as, as, as as demand for the resources continues to grow, we're going to shift away from. We're going to have to rely more on innovative, non-traditional desal type water sources, which is going to increase the overall cost over time. Of, um, of what we call blended product, or it's a big water cost blended product. Um, so that you see right now, $194 uh, per million gallons, that's going to, over time, you can just imagine it's going to go up. Um, so if we can offset the use of, or, or the demand of desal and other innovative sources and, and, and allow for, for prolonged use of the more traditional sources, we can keep that blended product cost a little bit lower, for hopefully longer and longer. If that makes sense. Anyway. So how do we prolong development of new water supplies? Um, well, certainly, I like to think that one, uh, one aspect would be rainwater harvesting um, and just conservation in general. Uh, so let's now uh, sort of talk about you know, why, what, what the problem is, and see a few examples. This was actually, I mentioned the first permanent rainwater system in the same peak. Um, this system here, I believe it was a thousand gallon rainwater system that was used purely for irrigation. It was the first one that we permitted in St. Pete. Um, they had Florida friendly landscaping there, and the thousand gallons lasted more than a month. Um, they're also pretty conservation minded in general, so they may be a little more than, more than, than some other people, but they're, they're, their, their landscape looks wonderful, and, and the system works great for them. So I believe it's the EPA Water Star for that to check their plan. This was not when I was involved in, so that's my caveat there, but uh, the Florida House Learning Center, if anybody's been there, that place is really cool. Uh, two, oh, it's not there anymore, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, that was really cool. Uh, first underground system that we, that we uh, worked on, it's below ground for Jordan Park Elementary School. 5,000 gallons total is used for toilet flushing, and when you look at an elementary school with I don't know, 500 kids or how many kids were there, the amount of toilet flushing. When I sat with the engineers and we actually calculated how much water is used every day, those 5,000 gallon tanks would draw down, I think every week is what we calculated. I mean, it's insane the amount of water that those little kids use. Um, so that was actually our first toilet flushing system. It was one of the first we used for non irrigation. Uh, so we're pretty proud of that system. We're close to the past year. Um, and in St. Pete, first potable system, this is a little interesting. The homeowners wanted to use this system for laundry, to offset laundry use, and toilets as well. Uh, the laundry um, plumbing codes is required to be hooked up to a potable fixture. Uh, so we essentially treat that water with drinking water standards. So even though it's not used for whole house potable uses, it is a potable system. Uh, and it's got a little over 100 gallons in the table. I'm sorry, I'm going to put it exactly. Moving on, um, this is a laundry waterfront project that we did where it was used for, again, toilets irrigation. I think it was, uh, yeah, it was a toilet irrigation. It's actually backed up by these flamed water. So, the homeowners pretty much never use boiling water except for drinking. 
this is our sort of our, our now flagship, and unfortunately, we don't have a better picture. Uh, this is a system where uh, it's 5,000 gallons, it's in the South Tampa, um, under the house. It's a great use of space under the house, uh, where the, the tanks supply all, all the water uses throughout the house, all potable and everything. Um, and in the foreground, In the foreground, bottom right, um, there's actually a gray water tank. And the gray water is fed from the master shower uh, and used for toilet flushing. And that in turn is backed up by rainwater. So it's a little hybrid system. So this house, we're still in the process of fine tuning. We just kind of, there were a few technical issues to work through. And we're in the process right now of sort of calculating what the monthly water demand is. Um, the certificate of occupancy just issued a few months ago, so we're still waiting and seeing what's going on with that. But that's an interesting system, and I'll talk more about the filtration and treatment and distribution systems that we're working on. Um, so, anyways, so we talk about some examples, um, show some examples, sort of what the problem is. So, now, what is rainwater harvesting? I think everybody in this room knows it's essentially collecting rainwater, falls from the sky, hits the house, or some kind of catchment area, not necessarily the roof, but in general it is. Um, and then it's the use of that rainwater, it's, it's kind of no point in the water just sitting stagnant in the tank unless you use it for some application. Um, and then it's also, it also involves stormwater management, so the, the discharge, the overflow, um, and then intercepting that water um, and, and, uh, and preventing it from, from running off down the impermeable surfaces um, and then getting into our bank and into our creek. So what are some possible uses? Quite a few, really. Pretty much anything you can think of water we can use for, uh, for rainwater. Most common would definitely be irrigation. The single biggest user, uh, but also other outdoor uses, like uh, washing fountains, for the lake, etc. Industrial processes, I'm really not going to talk about because I don't have a lot of experience in that, um, but you can imagine the amount of water used in industrial processes, the can offset small amounts of that, uh, it'd be a, a, a huge, huge deal. Indoor, I'm going to talk about toilet flushing, uh, and then any photo application. So really, again, I think the message is do we can to offset municipal supplies, you know, the produce water that's going to us to promote responsible work. So really, two, two things to focus on. This is actually from another talk where it was just rainwater offset. Um, really, the two categories I like to think of are indoor and outdoor. So important use offset, obviously, irrigation. I think everybody knows irrigation is just, it's, it's, it's half, half a lot of use in general. It's, uh, it's for easy for irrigation. So if you're putting in perfectly good drinking water for onto your lawn, it's, uh, it seems a waste of the infrastructure we've already talked about. A lot of time and effort is going to So the good news about irrigation is it's the simplest thing that anybody can control. Adjust your timers, adjust your sprinkler heads. You, know, you, you can really easily control the amount of water applied to your lawn. So that's an easy one to offset, and it's the one that's addressed the most by rainwater. Um, uh, so. so another important use to offset toilets. Um, so this is kind of this, you know, 20 gallons per person per day or more, depending on the efficiency or inefficiency of the fixture the toilet itself. Um, and some other non portable uses of the UNC that I talk about, etc. This is just an example I, uh, I just wanted to show why toilets are so important. Um, indoor water usage, these pie charts on the left, typical, so that you normally see relatively efficient toilets, 18 and a half, or fixtures in general, 18 and a half gallons used for toilet flushing. And on the right, water saving fixtures, is that 8.4 liters? 8.4 gallons? So big slices of the pie, so to speak, um, are toilet flushing. So if you can offset toilet flushing, you don't need perfectly good drinking water to send something out of sewer. Um, so, uh, so using rainwater for that is, uh, uh, has some potential benefits. So in summary, okay, the offsets there. Yeah, that's a range of uh, landscaping and toilets all the way. The two biggest users of, of water in general in a household are both non potable irrigation and toilets. So irrigation parts is the easy one to control, uh, and the easy one to adjust. Toilets, that's not as easy to adjust because you have to use your toilets. And I'm, I'm really not saying things to, you know, to 
to stop using toilets, um, but consider other other sources of, of flushing toilets. Another important offset, obviously, the bowl. It's actually not the best picture, but that's actually me drinking out of a spigot on the property. So, I, I didn't get sick afterwards. So, the bowl is going to simplify plumbing. With uh, the toilet systems, you have to run the separate plumbing ones. Um, so, it, it actually, it's, it's not as easy to do. There's obviously some issues. Uh, health and safety always, always is absolutely number one, so that's very important to get into later, making sure that no one's going to improve the system for the building stay away from that is really safe and reliable. Um, and the reliability factor I talked about right here. Um, you can imagine how angry your wife or your husband would be if the water in the shower just shuts off because it's not reliable and don't have some kind of popular source. So um, any, any kind of popular system needs to be both sized adequately to account for as much demand as possible and also have an alternate backup in case it's a long extended period of drought. Serviceability obviously maintenance, it's um, of course the red tape the regulatory, uh, which we're uh, fortunate enough to work through some of those issues. And of course at the top I have health list of toys because that's paramount. Uh, but true way to all the things. Another application I can mention briefly is um, stormwater management. So, so in general, the green water the rain water generally in most houses hits your, hits your ass on the shingle, roof, tank, and asphalt, and whatever's in there, houses, whatever. Once you have your gutters onto permeable, impermeable surface, right? Collecting, collecting dust and debris, you know, things going away, discharges down the street into the storm drain system, all in the middle, and then gets flushed into the bay. So by reducing any kind of runoff, you're reducing demand on the stormwater treatment infrastructure, so it's less water to be treated. Um, obviously reducing that runoff with discharge of things into it. And uh, groundwater infiltration and recharge, which leads to less demand on the It recharges those traditional water supplies, so there's less demand on the more expensive water supplies. So I like to think of I think of Okay, so we talked about offsets and uh, what the water can be used for. I'd like to talk now about the system of anatomy, basically, what is a tank? Uh, really, a tank is, or I'm, I'm sorry, system in general. You have a catchment area, um, rain, of course, conveying system, pre treatment, keep out coming through the course sediment to bring the source to itself, treatment and then distribution. It seems pretty straightforward. Uh, irrigation holding systems tend to be much simpler. You can minimize the pre-treatment, you can also minimize the post-tank treatment distribution is usually pretty easy. As you get more advanced, the the applications that you serve have to be more exploded flushing or cobalt, the, the, uh, the system becomes a little more complex. Especially in terms of treatment. So catchment basically the roof, for the most part, roof is your catchment area. Of course, there are catchment areas that the same part, you know, just we'll discuss the roof is the simplest of the water. And size determines harvesting potential is straightforward. Um, and the surface of the material, the slicker the better, pretty much. Um, metal roofs are the best. Uh, tile and asphalt shingles, not so much. So obviously the cold will be long. Slicker the better. Conveyance and pre-treatment. So the water quality is determined by the way it's source. Garbage in, garbage out. So you really want to minimize any of those bird droppings getting into your tank, if at all possible. Um, not only for potable, but also in the irrigation only systems and non potable you really don't want sludge and debris accumulating in the tank. Um, again, the clogging the inner heads, especially using drip where you have really tiny bins for like irrigation. So it's really important to keep out any of the debris, regardless of the application, and at least it's at least as, as much as possible. So some of the some of the ways we prevent um, debris from accumulating in tanks and things pre-screened, things like leaf guards um, and screened rain heads, those are I think everybody's seen them. You know, they, they go right on the gutters. Uh, some some are diamond lads, some have a finer material in them. Those are all great. 
I don't, you know, and, and I encourage them in every system that, that we work on, but from a design standpoint, from a reliability standpoint, from a water flow standpoint, I don't consider them permanent. I don't know if anybody's ever seen those the corners get peeled up and want to get a ton of pine needles in there and other things. So even though they're fundamental and important to have, everything after that gets treated as if those are not in place from a design standpoint. So what we can what, what are installed quite often, um, these things called first flush devices, I don't know if most familiar with them or not. Basically, um, let's see, if you see on the, the tank on the left on the far right, the green tank, alongside there's a pipe that runs alongside that pipe acts as a chamber. So the first X amount of water that comes off the roof that might carry the initial bit of dust and debris and, and whatnot, pollen and whatever, that'll first enter that little chamber before it then flows into the tank. So that and then it just kind of slowly trickles away from the deployment soil. Um, so anyway, sort of like I said, water kind of goes in and flows, it's ball kind of floats up. And then once that chamber is full, and then you know, different size pipes and different lengths can determine the volume that's, that's um, flushed away. At the end of a rainstorm, there's a tiny little trickle hole in the bottom, which then flushes out. So it then resets the system. Well, it just got a lot different. And in general, you want to uh, divert approximately 10 to 50 gallons per thousand square feet of roof area. Uh, and that's going to depend on the debris load. So if you have to kind of wide open, not a whole lot, uh, maybe just, you know, you don't need to divert as much. Um, if you have a heavy debris load on oak and overhanging canopies, um, then, then you're going to want to divert quite a lot. Um, and irrigation only systems, we do install them, but they're, they're more optional. It's not as important, but you do want to minimize the dust and debris, so it's still, it's still a consideration. Um, and I should say, too, in addition to just first flush, there are other ways to kind of um, pre treat water to prevent dirt and debris. We do talk about that kind of off topic later. Uh, so if you're not married to that kind of thing. Uh, so, cistern anatomy so, a tank is not just a tank, there are a lot of pipes and whatnot going into it, um, venting. To, as air is displaced, inlet, outlet, generally needs to be sized um, according to stormwater regulations. You know, if you need four inch pipe going in, you need four inch pipe going out. If you need six inch going in, six inch going out, etc. Uh, a little calming device on the, the left side there. That, that prevents any, any debris that does accumulate at the bottom of a tank, that prevents it from getting stirred up and, and accumulating and uh, kind of sloshed around. And in, coupled with a floating filter on the inlet, on the the, the suction side, you're always drawing from the cleanest part of water, so you prevent water from being stirred up and then you draw from the cleanest part of the tank. And then there's an overflow, of course, we talked about a drain for servicing and things like that. And things vary a little bit, and some things are optional, some aren't. Uh, but for the most part, it's a pretty, pretty typical anatomy. Um, and then distribution it's a pump, so that'll work right there. Select the appropriate pump for your water demand. This is where, you know, if it's a really big complex system, we'll work closely with the plumbing engineers. Uh, generally, irrigation type pumps tend to work really well. Uh, in fact, that's what we usually use for irrigation systems. Uh, but because you're not drawing down from a you know, 100 foot or 200 foot deep well, you're drawing essentially from the surface. You don't need to use as large a pump, which is nice. Uh, but you, know, you can always scale it up just to make sure you have enough pressure. So. And then a makeup supply. Um, if, if you anticipate low water conditions, um, or if, if your landscape requires more than is practical to supply completely by rainwater, maybe some kind of, you know, whether it be a well or reclaimed or, or whatever, um, something like that, and you can have valves and switching and all that stuff to automate it. And if you do tie into any other system, you need some kind of backflow prevention. Backflow prevention. So distribution after the tank again. Um, distribution is really the pump and valve switching, um, any makeup valves that tie in like we discussed, and of course backflow prevention. Uh, I want to include with, with uh, distribution. Um, and and we, we tend to put, uh, sort of potable, but for most systems we tend to put our, um, our makeup valves and switches, we tend to make them normally open so that in any kind of a fail-safe scenario, if you lose power or whatever, you, you're all, always providing some sort of a large spot. 
These are examples of pumps. I don't suspect most people will have the one on the left. Um, the one on the right is much more common. And I included that kind of dirty heat up pump because we actually did tie into that pump and use it for irrigation because there was no sense wasting money on a new pump when this 30 year old pump worked really well still. Um, but in general, that's the type of, that's what you normally see. So an existing sprinkler pump, if you're using irrigation, there's already in that place. So the treatment is, is the next phase after distribution that makes part of the system. Uh, and so the water quality must meet appropriate standards for intended application. Uh, so if, if, um, if, if it's going to be potable, obviously it has to be treated to drinking water standards. Um, and there are certain guidelines, NSF um, and EPA uh, regulations and guidelines that dictate what the, uh, what the treatment level needs to be. Otherwise, non potable uh, toilet flushing um, may require uh, dye injection, which that's really because gray water is what's codified in the building codes, and there's really no, there's really nothing specified for rainwater, so it's sometimes easier just to put a dye injection system on, even though it's really not gray water, it's, it's rainwater. But the point is, you have to treat it or at least indicate what's going on, and then some kind of disinfection for the application. Irrigation leaves a minimal treatment. I mean, you think anybody who has a well, your well water is not really being treated, so rainwater is actually probably yeah, cleaner or at least equivalent to well water, so you don't really need a whole lot of treatment for that. Maybe some 70 screening, things like that. And of course, no regulations. Uh, and so then going from, uh, so potable, like I mentioned, um, potable uh, has higher treatment requirements um, than, than non potable. So we tend to do um, substantial um, sediment plus carbon infiltration. NSF 53 is a standard um, for cyst removal to, to define how cysts are removed and make sure the equipment meets the standard. And disinfection, NSF 55A is UV treatment of surface water. So it, essentially rainwater after being treated, all pre-treated, and then passes through UV sterilizer to disinfect the water. Uh, there are other disinfection options, such as chlorine, ozone, reverse osmosis, etc. The problem is chlorine obviously chemical. Um, ozone, I just don't know much about it, but the household systems aren't that great. And then reverse osmosis, it, it actually wastes water to have a reverse osmosis system because the system has to flush itself out every few days. So on really large systems, RO is actually efficient, but on smaller residential ones, RO is not as efficient. So I, I was going to prefer UV if possible. Um, and all of our portable systems, we use components that meet or exceed NSF 53 and 55A. So this is what potable kind of schematic look like this for the manufacturer. Um, and this is that exact same schematic um, on the wall of the house in St. Pete. Um, and this is a similar one uh, in Tampa with a different UV unit, which I like a lot better. And three stages instead of two stages of filtration. Um, so a bit of piping and wiring and, and all that good stuff. Um, <coughs> some switching controls, all that good stuff. So. Moving on from there. Dollars and cents. Um, let's see. This is obviously about cost. So cistern to installation cost ratio. Um, right around. So we have right around sixty to forty is the ratio, give or take. In this, that's pretty reasonable. Um, however, that's kind of the mid range. Uh, like, like I mentioned before, per gallon cost decreases as um, volume increases. So you may pay more up front, you know, you have fixed costs, you have filtration, you have pumping, you have all things that aren't going to go away no matter what size the tank is. Um, so, so that ratio may change accordingly, and as you go on, obviously, it will decrease. Um, so in general, uh, like I mentioned, price per volume changes. Uh, smaller the storage capacity, the higher the cost. So anyway, so one thing I always recommend is if budget allows, Try to go larger, you know, because I get more money from it. Um, try to go larger because the cost of efficiency or the cost effectiveness is better, and also you can never really have too much stored water. Anybody who uses rainwater for irrigation knows you burn through those tanks pretty quickly if you use it substantially. So the larger the better. And then maintenance responsibilities. When it's all said and done, you have a system installed and in place. Um, there are a lot of mechanical components. There's no getting around, getting away from that. So there's some, some general maintenance requirements 
it would be necessary, obviously, to check for debris. Um, and that's, that's relatively easy to do. Maybe once in a while, drain the tank and flush it out. Um, inspect gutters and downspouts and um, any, any other components, of the, the conveyance components, I should say, and those who need that debris to clean the gutters. So you may have to clean the gutters more often than most people do, which is sort of a pain. Um, I tend to do it every Christmas. And the first flush, I was cleaning those uh, downspouts. I saw that leaks and similar rings to well. And then also, I didn't mention on here any filtration, cartridges, things like that. If there's a sediment strainer for irrigation, maybe clean that out as well. Uh, so, size of the light bulb. This is where it starts to get, uh, this may get a little convoluted. So, if anybody has questions, feel free to interrupt. Uh, but what dictates size of storage? Captured water or water demand? Um, so it's a two of demand. You don't need to put in a swimming pool size system if you're only planning on irrigating you know, a, a small little vegetable garden or something like that. So I, I don't want this to be a calculus lesson. Um, so, just for simplicity's sake, when calculating the, the potential that can possibly be, be captured, so there's really no sense exceeding what you read. If you have a 500 square foot roof, you're never going to fill that, fill a 50,000 gallon tank. It's just not going to happen. So, to calculate, you know, what, what you don't want to exceed, um, or what, what the maximum catchment potential is, I should say, it's a it, it's a pretty straightforward calculation. Um, you can throw in some coefficients and other variables for efficiency, but for the most part, it's uh, catchment area times rainfall. So in general, let me see if I was here. Don't to If I ever get that, so in general you're looking. Basically, Experienced landscaping to, to know that. 
what a lot of people do, which I think is an inaccurate way of calculating it, is because this is a little more complicated, what a lot of people do is just say, okay, an inch of water, how much would it take to just do an inch of water? And you see that a lot in just irrigation in general, just throw an inch of water on the landscape, or throw half an inch of water, or whatever it is. But by calculating it this more complicated way, you get a much more accurate assessment of what your real landscape needs are. Um, but it, it, it also puts a lot of responsibility on the user's back to make sure that irrigation um, is, perf it, it is performed, and irrigation cycles are performed only when plants need them. Which I think is, you know, this group I'm sure probably is very familiar with that talks about that quite a lot. So rather than just throwing into water on the ground, which wastes a lot of water than necessary, use exactly the plant's needs in this calculation and essentially account for that. Um, and in, oh, sorry. Indoor use is actually a pretty simple calculation. Uh, in general, gallons, gallons per capita, gallons per person, per, times the number of people times per day. Uh, and that's actually pretty simple. So you know, flush your toilets X number of times a day, use X number of gallons for showering. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to calculate that. So that's, that's actually pretty straightforward. And like I said, that doesn't really fluctuate as much. Irrigation really can fluctuate a lot because you can dictate how efficient the irrigation system is. There. And this, I have to thank um, Tampa Bay Water. They actually provided a lot of this data. And um, Pasha over at USF actually put a lot of it together. And was, as I was fortunate enough to get my hands on this thing. Two people actually put these, uh, these things together. Um, so it's very important when designing a system. And, and I, I actually skipped out a lot of the really detailed complex slides because it gets a little overwhelming, even for, my, for myself. Um, to what degree is rainwater reliable? You basically want to make sure that if you're going to size the system 100% effectively, it's going to provide all of your water for your irrigation demand. You have to make sure that the tank is going to be large enough, and that's going to be determined by the amount of rainfall. You, you want to make sure that you're not going to use up all the water in the tank before the next rainfall event. So you kind of take into account what the annual rainfall cycle is. Um, and this, this counts for that from what was 30 years from the 70s to 2008. It's probably it's changed a little bit. Um, and in this slide, um, I, I definitely removed a lot of other data from here, but essentially what's going on here, um, this is assuming St. Augustine, which I hope not too many people have, um, but St. Augustine, this is the, the light green sort of shows what the demand is, what, what St. Augustine needs for, um, for irrigation, and the blue is trans, transferable from that previous slide that shows essentially what the rainfall is. And so if you look at the months of you know, April, May, March, um, there's actually a deficit, so there's not enough rain, so you need to make sure that tank volume is large enough to account for that deficit, which you can store, and then you also, as part of that, make sure that your catchment area can provide enough of that offset in, in order to make sure that you don't have to rely on any kind of make up or back of water supply. Does that make sense? Or is that really confusing? Because I think I just confused myself. And this is essentially this is essentially a little more of that um, same same data the harvest of rainfall um, rainfall potential of orange and green is um, well it's, it's pretty much what I already said you need to make sure the sizes are accordingly there's um, there's an adjusted rainfall event which assumes that not every year is going to be is going to fit the average that's what that that one that is um, but really it, it's the same principle essentially you want to make sure that you can account for the deficit. In the, in, in the drier months. Um, you can sit down and talk about the size of the system properly. So the advice is, that the take home is, um, you know, you can obviously adjust the anticipated irrigation use if you're using a smaller tank, um, and you can always add another tank later. So if you find that you're irrigating, you know, just common sense, rather than sitting down with pencil and paper and figuring out what you need, you know, put in a thousand gallon tank. See how it goes. If after a year you realize it's not very effective, call us back, pay us more money, and uh, put in another tank. And preferably call us back later on and put in another tank. I'm just kidding. Um, point is, you can always add something later. And the tanks, once everything's in place, the piping's in place, the pumps in place, it's really easy to just drop another tank in place. Well, I'm assuming that you know, they don't have to do it. So talk more about some of the red tape. Um, 
some of the regulatory considerations. Um, complex systems require collaboration and knowledge of various regulations, laws, and guidelines. So all these regulatory considerations, you have engineering needs to be done in order to talk with the building departments, and the health departments need to, need to be aware of you know, how healthy the water is, it needs to be monitored, and the EPA sets all these guidelines for treatment, and we follow NSF regularly. So the point is that everybody has to, there are a lot of partners involved, everybody has to kind of play nicely and collaborate nicely. Um, as a contractor, we want to be the go-between, which works nicely because a lot of this job is education of not just homeowners, but education of building officials who might otherwise be um, unfamiliar with rainwater systems. Um, and also, a lot of times, since rainwater is not directly spelled out in plumbing codes, it's very difficult from a liability standpoint for a building official who's not knowledgeable to just blindly just sign off, um, sign off on a permit or something because they don't want to, they don't want to, to, to take that liability risk for the municipality. Um, there are also some, so there's electric guidelines and uh, gray water building codes are for, are for um, uh, oh, 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 look at that so Everything starts engineering like Building codes, I can actually start to find what buildings are. Building codes that come into play are gray water, plumbing, and electrical. Gray water for non potable um, like I said, nothing codified specifically for rainwater, so there's, there's a gray water, it's um, the International Plumbing Codes, and you see if anybody wants to look it up. C101.9. Um, and rainwater, for lack of better definition, for lack of better codes for rainwater, rainwater is going to fall for non potable if it's used for indoor uses like toilet flushing. I really don't agree with it, but as of right now, there are no rainwater, no rainwater specific building codes, so we follow it. Um, and, it and it works nicely. Um, but rainwater, obviously, is a large increase in each shower and things like that, so it's not as necessary. It's not, it doesn't need you know, that injection, which is um, plumbing codes, of course, stormwater drainage, especially as part of the plumbing codes, it's properly sizing your stormwater that you can use. Um, and then electrical codes, of course, you can pump some of the codes. Health departments, local and state, you know, we have to make sure that we, you know, when everybody plays nice in the health department, um, I have to tell you something about Okay, so the EPA actually sets the guideline. They actually define rainwater, and rainwater is actually defined as sur surface water. So rainwater harvested in cisterns um, falls under the surface water definition, which is from the EPA. So it can be treated to potable standards. Um, it's considered a private well or a private surface water source. Um, so it doesn't actually need to be monitoring the public water supplies do, but um, you still want to monitor at least the initial installation periodically to make sure that we're still meeting the standards and that filtration system appears to still work well. Um, I think that was really long winded, we'll start with that, so if you have nice questions, let me know. Um, I think so. So I, mean, I think I actually just this actually went quicker than I thought, so we have a lot of time for questions. But um, I might have any slides here, why don't I So in summary, hard spring water is a viable practical water supply tops and we we talked about those offsets already. Um, the the long and short of it is we want to off, we want to prolong our existing domestic water infrastructure uh, as best we can using alternative supplies such as rainwater um, in addition to just general water conservation. Uh, for potable and, and actually not just for potable but for um, for any application we want to strict attention has to be paid to health, reliability and regulatory concerns. Health, certainly, you know, you want to drink it from dirty water. Reliability, um, especially both sides of the and there needs to be a makeup supply or backup supply uh, if, this, if the system is, is on the smaller side. And of course, regulatory, the red tape. Proper design, I, I tell nearly everybody who, who calls on the phone and who I speak with um, and discuss the system with, they'll send some, some building plans or some, some site plans and say, hey, can you design a system for us? Sure, no problem. Where's your landscape design? And nobody ever has a landscape design. So I encourage um, builders, especially, um, or anybody considering building, to, um, to basically consider landscape much earlier in the construction process. Usually it's kind of not an afterthought, but it's not really considered as early as it could be, especially if we're doing 
the rainwater systems on a new construction, there's a lot of rough and plumbing and other things that need to be done early on in new construction. And if we don't have the system sized properly early on, then they can be added cost later. So I always tell people, let's think of your landscape first, and then we can design from there. We don't want to go too big, we don't want to go too small, we want to look just right. Um, finished product, um, obviously must meet standards for intended application. So if it's potable, it has to be drinking, water safe. Fail safe reliability and redundancy should be a consideration you know, for irrigation. Uh, irrigation of a, of a native or a drought tolerant landscape, that might not be as necessary because you can, you can survive quite well in the drought. Um, and then, of course, everything's a collaboration. At least I'm, I'm very much in favor of everything being a collaboration. I like to play as nicely with as many people as possible because I don't know everything and I don't claim to know everything and I don't feel that I want to know everything. Um, so I like to call in and, and work closely and have meetings with everybody involved um, in the process and education. I, I can't emphasize education enough. And so an event like this where people are actually out, quite a lot of people actually come out and promoting this and the extension services um, and some of the players involved in you know, are promoting education, I think that's huge because you know, things to, more things like this need, um, need to be shared so that there's, so there's a lot of wider adoption of in general. Um, besides that, uh, a lot of people contributed to some of the data and material that were in these slides, so I have to thank all these people. Um, USF provided a lot of the calculus and graphs, and obviously the floor for the landscape and program rocks all out here. Our uh, Florida Rainwater Harvesting Initiative, this was actually, a lot of this was based on the initial talks of the Florida Rainwater Harvesting Initiative and some initial slides and presentations they put together. Um, so, I thank that group, of which I'm a member, for allowing me to steal some of their work in the Florida Education Society. Um, so last thing, so um, Lynn asked me um, to kind of consider some sort of discount for everybody involved, and I always want to give discounts whenever I can, um, you know, especially for a large group like this. So I was, I was going to say, just, you know, 10% off everything, just give me a call or something, do whatever. And, and I'll stand by that. Anything you want, just give a call and, and, and you'll get a 10% discount. Um, but I realized we're, we're kind of in the process right now. Um, I'm working with our website guy of, uh, of, of redoing our website and improving the shopping cart process. So this, this fat boy tank that's on our site, it's a really cool tank, especially for do-it-yourselfers. Relatively inexpensive. It's, it's not only five, it's a little pricier than some other tanks. But it's low profile, it's very attractive, it can fit up alongside the wall. Um, and you can, do, you can install yourself really easily, just get drop shipped right to your house. Um, does, I'm sorry, that one is seven, uh, was it 650, I think, 700 gallons, something like that? I think it's 650, yeah, 650. Um, does include a pump, but if you have a pump, that's pretty much the only thing you have to add, and of course, all the other words, like that. And I'm willing to go anywhere close by um, to help install it. So, again, if you get me, whether, you know, for better or worse, you know, you need it. Get me with the deal. So that'll kind of help me figure out and leave feedback so I know um, and I can send to our web guy you know, how, our, how our checkout process is. Um, so anyway. Yeah, actually, I cut you on the right side a little bit. Um, it's about two feet wide by, I think, about seven feet long by about six feet tall. So if you're alongside a fence, you might have to, it might be slightly higher than the fence. And then about, yeah, like six or seven feet long. And, and the, the two feet makes it really nice. And you can actually put a bunch of them. You can almost make a fence with them. They look pretty cool. Um, and enter this discount code. That's important. Hey, Brian. Yeah. How about this? Yeah. Would you guys like to take maybe a five, seven minute break, get another donut, get a cup of coffee, get some water, and then we'll go into the question and answer session? Yeah, I'd like to do that. And then, you know,